I was in the um, supermarket and I swiped my bank card. And so that you've got the little screen and you watch it intently while it prompts you to do the next step. So you confirm the amount, enter your PIN. Well, during those intervals, um, I was shown advertisements on the little screen because some genius had figured out that a person in that situation is a captive audience. Mm -hmm. And the intervals themselves, I had previously just assumed it was you know, a function of the communication technology, now seem to be something more deliberately calibrated. These haltings now served somebody's interest. And you know, I started to see things like this everywhere. It seems like a new frontier of capitalism has been opened up by our self-appointed disruptors, uh, where the point is to dig up and monetize every bit of private headspace. Now, of course, we've developed habits for trying to tune this out. But if you ride the bus in uh, South Korea now, you have advertising squirted into your nose, essentially. There's a smell resembling that of Dunkin' Donuts coffee that's released into the bus's ventilation system at the same time that the Dunkin' Donuts jingle plays over the sound system. And all this occurs just as the bus is pulling up outside a Dunkin' Donuts. And the driver points out the fact, in case you somehow missed it at that point. <clears throat> I'm making my way through O'Hare Airport in Chicago and not feeling especially receptive to the message that's applied to the moving handrail on the escalator. It says, you're in charge in this endlessly recurring loop. I don't feel very in charge. It seems like every surface of public space is being auctioned off to private interests. Finally, I get to my gate at the airport with an hour to kill, and I'm unable to escape the chattering of CNN. The introduction of novelty into our field of view commands what the cognitive psychologists call an orienting response. So an animal turns its face and eyes to the new thing. It could be a python, so it's an important <laughs> evolutionary adaptation in a world of predators. But of course, a new thing typically appears about once every second on TV. The images on the screen jump out of the flow of experience and make a demand on us. Now, <clears throat> in that kind of situation, people often stare at their phones or open a novel, hoping uh, to tune out the piped-in chatter. In this battle of attentional technologies, um, what's lost, I think, is the kind of public space that's required for a certain kind of sociability. A public space where people are not self-enclosed in the heightened way that happens when our minds are elsewhere than our bodies may feel rich with possibility for spontaneous encounters. Even if we don't converse with others, our mutual reticence is experienced as reticence if our attention is not otherwise bound up, but is rather free to alight upon one another and linger or not because we ourselves are free to pay out our attention in deliberate measures. To be the object of someone's reticence is quite different from not being seen by them. We may have a vivid experience of having encountered another person, even if in silence. Such encounters are always ambiguous, and their need for interpretation gives rise to a train of imaginings that are often erotic. I think that's what makes cities exciting. Now, of course, um, you know, in that airport scene, you can simply shift in your seat and avert your gaze from the screens. But the fields of view that haven't been captured for commerce seem to be getting fewer and narrower. The ever more complete penetration of public spaces by attention-getting technologies exploits the orienting response in a way that preempts sociability, directing us away from one another and toward a manufactured reality the content of which is determined from afar by private parties that have a material interest in doing so.